Friends, welcome to this time of worship as we gather together during this second week of the Lenten season. We are drawn together into this space by the Holy Spirit who captures us and invites us to be present with God. We're privileged today to hear the message around truth from Dr. Dan Ulrich, our professor of New Testament studies, and we look forward to the word that he brings, inspired by the Spirit. I invite you to stand for our opening hymn, which is also our call to worship, number 51, Let the Whole Creation Cry. You may be seated. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and love of neighbor. Repentance, fasting, prayer, study, and works of love help us to return unto that love. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourselves to love God and neighbor by confessing your sin now and by asking God for strength to persevere in your Linton journey. Let us share now the words of confession after this moment of silent prayer. Wow. 
Father in heaven. Your love brings life to dead souls, light to darkened minds, strength to weak wills. Help us to believe and trust that no wrong we have done, no good we have failed to do, is too great for you to pardon through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son. For God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn toward the faithful path. May God keep you in grace by the Holy Spirit, lead you to greater faith and trust, and bring you in peace to the life that is truly life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now in response, we will sing number 562. Let nothing trouble you, let nothing frighten you. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone is enough. Scripture, which brings our focus today, comes from the first book of Kings, the 22nd chapter. We'll be reading verses 1 through 28 of this text. For three years, Aram and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah came down to the king of Israel. The king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? Yet we are doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. He said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. Your people are my people. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of them, and said to them, Shall I go to battle with Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? They said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. 
But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom we may inquire? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one other by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlah, but I hate him. For he never prophesies anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Jehoshaphat said, let the king not say such a thing. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and king Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting in, on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Chenaanas, made for himself horns of iron, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying the same and saying, Go up to remote Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the words of the prophets with one, one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of the one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. When he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to remote Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? He answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each one return and go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy anything favorable about me, nothing but disaster? Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all of the host of heaven standing beside him to the right and to the left of him. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Then one said one thing and another said another until a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. How the Lord asked him. He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Then the Lord said, you are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these, your prophets. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Chenaanah, came up to Micaiah, slapped him on the cheek and said, which way did the Spirit of the Lord pass for me to speak to you? Micaiah replied, you will find out on that day when you go in to hide in an inner chamber. The king of Israel then ordered, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him on reduced rations of bread and water until I come in peace. Micaiah said, if you return in peace, then the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear, you peoples, all of you. Every year, Oxford Dictionaries publishes a word of the year. 
kind of like Time Magazine's Person of the Year. In 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. According to Oxford English Dictionary, post-truth is an adjective which means relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion or personal belief. I'll let you take that as it is. By that definition, it seems to me that we've been living in a post-truth world for some time. The goal of my sermon is not to defend the concept of objective facts as a measure of truth or to say much about what it means to be in a post-truth world, except I want to warn about the danger, the danger that widespread lying poses for our world today. If a post-truth world means that humanity has grown indifferent to lying and deceit, then we all need a wake-up call. And the shocking scripture story you heard just now might help. I was a teenager in 1971 when Daniel Ellsberg courageously leaked a classified history of the Vietnam War called the Pentagon Papers. By then, the U.S. public was sharply divided over the war. My family was staunchly opposed to it in a brethren sort of way. Many of our neighbors thought that the war was necessary to contain communism. The Pentagon Papers revealed that successive administrations of our government had been lying to the public about the war for more than a decade. They not only called it a success when they knew otherwise, they also lied about basic facts like casualty counts. I remember the outrage people felt upon learning that their government had been lying in a way that cost many thousands of lives. Demonstrations against the war got more intense, and many people who had supported the war changed their minds because of the facts. At about that same time, I visited my grandparents. My grandfather asked me a question that has stuck with me. Suppose, he said, you're taking a trip and you lose your way. You don't have a map and your only hope is to stop and ask people for directions. That was before GPS. Now some of the people you ask tell you the truth. Some of them pretend to know and just tell you something. And some are so ornery that they deliberately steer you wrong. Now imagine that the percentage of liars increases and the percentage of truth tellers decreases. How high, he asked, can the percentage of liars get before you can no longer find your way? I couldn't answer the question with a number, but I got the point. We cannot live well as a society, much less make progress, unless most of us tell the truth most of the time. If lying becomes the norm, then trust breaks down. We can't find our way. The world suffers. Fast forward 50 years to late last year. Another event occurred eerily similar to the publication of the Pentagon Papers back in 71. The Washington Post won a lawsuit 
forcing the government to release 2,000 pages of notes and interviews about the war in Afghanistan. The interviews showed that senior officials and successive administrations had repeatedly made claims about the war that they knew were false. Statistics were altered to make the war seem to be going better than it was. Once again, our government had lied to us. But something is different now, isn't it? Few people seem surprised, much less outraged. Are we now so used to deception that we hardly care about it, even when it costs many thousands of lives? Lying by people in authority destroys the trust that holds our society together, the trust that governments and institutions need in order to carry out their legitimate functions. Lying destroys a leader's credibility. And I'm not just talking about our unbelievable president, but I am talking about him. 15,000 plus lies have taken a toll. Now when our president warns European allies about the security threat posed by the Chinese tech company Huawei, they treat him like the boy who cried wolf. And who feels reassured when our president declares that the COVID-19 virus is no worse than the flu and is likely to disappear this summer? Credibility is a terrible thing to squander. Some of our government's most dangerous lies are about the climate crisis. It is an obvious lie to say that the crisis is a hoax perpetrated by self-interested scientists or the Chinese government, you name the culprits. That's a blatant lie, but the lie is no less dangerous for being obvious. It continues to function as an excuse to postpone actions that are urgently needed to mitigate a worsening catastrophe that will affect all life on Earth. This is not a time when we can afford to tolerate such lies. As we think about the politics of lying, it might be useful to distinguish two terms, postmodernism and authoritarianism. Postmodernism is a, at root a call for humility. It says that perceptions of reality are always subjective and that we need to learn from the perspectives of others even as we share our own perspectives. Authoritarianism is much older than postmodernism and very different. Authoritarian, authoritarianism means that the people in power get to decide what is true. If you contradict those deciders, you lose your job, or your freedom, or maybe your head. Our authoritarian president seems to operate on the assumptions that he can make things true just by saying so. Subordinates who contradict him tend to lose their jobs. In other parts of the world, and in other countries, contradicting the ruler is more likely to cost you your head. Now today's biblical story shows how essential it is for people of faith to speak out against the lies of authoritarian leaders. Just before the part that Dan read, Ahab and his queen Jezebel have angered God by falsely accusing a man named Naboth in order to confiscate his vineyard. God has vowed that Ahab and Jezebel's fate will be like Naboth's. When Ahab hears this, he puts on a sackcloth and ashes, and God temporarily, temporarily revokes the punishment. But Ahab clearly has a rocky relationship 
with both God and the truth. Now, as we heard, Ahab next asked Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, for help in capturing Ramoth Gilead, a town across the Jordan. Jehoshaphat immediately says, yes, I am as you are. My people are as you are, your people. My horses, your horses. Only after saying yes to Ahab's plan does Jehoshaphat ask for an oracle from Yahweh. Ahab is happy to have his prophets comply with this request, if only to make it appear that God has endorsed the war. So Ahab calls together his 400 prophets and asks them for an oracle using all the right words from Israel's holy war tradition. Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And of course the verdict is immediate and unanimous. Go up. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Jehoshaphat, however, is not convinced by this supposed word from the God. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, realizes that Ahab's prophets will say whatever Ahab wants without actually experiencing any divine revelation. So Jehoshaphat asks for a 401st opinion. Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom may we, we may inquire? And remarkably, Ahab tells the truth. Yes, there is. Micaiah ben Imla, but I hate him because he never says anything good about me. You like that? Like the press. <laughs> Jehoshaphat replies, let the king not say such a thing. We're left to wonder what he means. Don't tell the truth. Don't expect Micaiah to prophesy disaster. I don't know. In any case, the kings agree to suffer, summon Micaiah. And meanwhile, the 400 prophets put on a show outside the gate in Samaria, a place as visible to the public as possible. One of the king's yes men, by the name of Zedekiah makes some horns that he can wear like a bull. That's not BS, although it is. That's BH, bull's horn, a symbol of military power. With these horns, Zedekiah declares, you shall gore the Arameans until they de they're destroyed. All the prophets say the same thing as the king used religion to drum up popular support for their war in a public spectacle. Now the messenger that fetches Micaiah encourages him to join with those other prophets in saying just what the king wants. But Micaiah, being a prophet with integrity, insists that he'll only repeat what God says to him. Now Micaiah has prophesied disaster against Ahab in the past, so we expect him to deliver another stern word of judgment. But no, he surprises us by repeating what the other prophets had said. Go up and triumph. Has Micaiah caved and started lying like the other prophets? Or does God really favor the war? Again, we don't know. Ahab is suspicious, kind of like I get suspicious when a student's paper doesn't sound like him or her. Ahab asks, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah tells the truth. He gives the sort of message Ahab was expecting from him all along. Micaiah describes a future when the war is over. The shepherd and master, meaning Ahab, is dead, and everyone can go home in peace. It's a defeat for Ahab, but actually a relief for his soldiers. They get to go home. And at this point in the story, it's gotten really confusing. Micaiah has promised to only say what God tells him. And yet he has given two dramatically different oracles. Go up and conquer, you're going to get killed. Which is true. How could both be from God? Fortunately, we don't have to wait long for the whole truth. Micaiah promises, pro proclaims a third message from the Lord that solves the riddle of the previous two. 
the shockingly bad news is that the lying in this story started with God. Micaiah reports a vision of God's throne room, a word from the Lord. God asked the heavenly security council for a a volunteer to entice Ahab into a fatal attack at remote Gilead. And a spirit has volunteered from that council to go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. Now we know Amakiah said different things. The first time he spoke, he was repeating the lie that God wanted him to say. The second time, urged to tell the truth, he tells the truth. It seems that God is too truthful to keep lying for very long. Maybe God has abandoned the plan to give this lying king a taste of his own poison. At the very least, Ahab has an opportunity to change his plans. But no, the plot twists again. Ahab and Jehoshaphat choose to ignore the truth. Zedekiah, our master of BH, attempts to shame Micaiah with a slap and a biting question. And Micaiah predicts shame for Zedekiah, after which Ahab throws Micaiah into prison. Ahab expects to deal with Micaiah as a false prophet after he returns from victory. But Ahab's not as confident as he sounds. As the story continues beyond what you heard, Ahab asked Jehoshaphat to wear the royal robes into battle Ahab will not appear to be the king. He will go disguised as an ordinary soldier, hoping that either the Arameans or God will kill Jehoshaphat instead. The deception just keeps going, doesn't it? Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Jehoshaphat has little choice but to accept this proposal, having already promised, I am as you are. How ironic. But the latest deception does not work well for Ahab. The Arameans recognize that Jehoshaphat is not the one they're really after. They're after Ahab. So they leave Jehoshaphat alone. The battle continues. And a stray arrow, we're not told from who, pierces Ahab's armor and wounds him so that he bleeds to death. And he bleeds to death propped up in his chariot because his men do not want to tell the truth that he is wounded. They want it to appear that he is okay and he dies. Oh, what a tangled web. Now, if you came today looking for a simple answer to the problem of lying politicians, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Instead, the scripture has given us a warning, a cautionary tale that deceit can be deadly. The most shocking aspect of this story is that God is portrayed as a sponsor of deceit. What can we do with this story? As a follower of Jesus, I respond to this story like other biblical stories with the goal of seeking the mind of Christ. I ask, What do you think about this story, Jesus? What message would you have us draw from it? What more do you have to say? I've not heard any direct answers from Jesus, but I think Jesus might want to remind us of his own courageous efforts to speak the truth to power, even at the cost of his life. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus was on trial before a Roman governor who had little concern for the truth. Jesus told the truth about his nonviolent kingdom, a reign that does not follow the deceitful patterns of this world. Jesus tells Pilate, For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate responds, What is truth? Either he doesn't know or doesn't care. But Jesus still stands up for the truth that sets people free. 
Jesus says to us, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Speak with integrity. Tell the truth. Oh, there may be times when lies are the lesser evil, like when the Hebrew midwives lie to protect the baby boys from Pharaoh's genocide. But as a rule, on a day-to-day -day basis, as a habit, a virtue that we learn over time, we are called to tell the truth. Anything else comes from the evil one. And Jesus reveals to us a God who is trust, truthful and trustworthy in the fullest sense of that word. If the plan to deceive Ahab was an exception to God's trustworthiness, it's an exception that proves the rule because God quick, quickly changes course and respond to Ahab's demand for truth. Jesus asks us to care about the truth, to speak the truth, and to insist on the truthfulness of our leaders. We cannot afford to be cheerleaders for lying politicians of any stripe. We need to speak and act with utmost integrity if Christians are ever to regain some of the trust that we have lost in the last several decades. If we're ever tempted to shade the truth in order to make ourselves, our churches, or our seminary look better, Jesus is asking us to resist that temptation with all the wisdom and courage we can muster. We can confront the hard truths of our time with courage because our hope ultimately rests in Jesus. Let's not just avoid lying. Let's do our best to discern, speak, and even sing the whole truth because the well-being of the world depends on it.
may we heed this most important warning that comes to us from Scripture on this day. As we walk through this week and we're faced with those moments, may we find the truth and speak it boldly for the well-being of the world depends upon it. Go now in peace.